Hello and welcome everybody, I'm a proper Varian and I got a mod for you here today that I have had in my possession for quite some time but sadly was never able to make a video on it. I am talking about Apotheosis, the Hellenistic Age. This mod has been in development for quite some time and is being spearheaded by a number of highly dedicated developers. In this video I would like to give you a general overview of the mod's time period but also take a very good look at the features that you can already find within the mod that will ensure a unique experience. If you want to ask the devs any questions or help them out, make sure to join their Discord. The link is, as always, in the description. Now let's start out with the basics of this time period. It is the year 275 BCE and the winds of fate have begun to turn against the Greek rulers of the world. Alexander died almost 50 years ago, leaving behind squabbling families and warlords that attempted to consolidate their power at the cost of their rivals. In this massively important year 275 BCE, it is the legendary General Pyrrhus, the greatest commander of this age, that has just been fought back by the Romans, resulting in the loss of all of his possessions in southern Italy and Sicily. While the Greek city-states in the South Italian region are now at Rome's mercy, the core of the Greek world cannot be concerned with their circumstances and instead has to deal with their own problems. Pyrrhus returning from his campaign in southern Italy and Sicily means that he is returning with a great many soldiers that are waiting for their payday. Historically, Pyrrhus decided to push deep into Macedonia to remedy his financial issues and push his claim on the throne. During this campaign, he did indeed successfully gain control of most of the kingdom, but quickly became unpopular by allowing Gallic mercenaries to raid the tombs of the Macedonian kings. From there, he would then go on a campaign on the Peloponnese in an attempt to consolidate his power there as well. This campaign, however, would prove futile and he would perish during it. Pyrrhus has a lot of potential at the start date to either be a complete failure or to become the greatest warlord of them all. It will be up to you to determine his fate. Let's move on and take a good look at what remains of the heirs to Alexander, the Diadochi. In Macedonia itself, before Pyrrhus arrives to take the throne, you can find Antigonos Gonatas, son of Demetrios and grandson of the legendary Antigonos Monophthalmos. The Antigone dynasty has fallen into a deep abyss after their founder Antigonos lost the struggle for the broken pieces of Alexander's old empire. Now the Antigone dynasty is barely holding on and has come under severe pressure domestically as well as externally. Despite this pressure and despite Pyrrhus at the borders, Antigonos Gonatas would prove to be quite the great ruler. He was equipped with a deep-rooted fear of leaving things to luck. Both his father and his grandfather had been highly ambitious in their desire to reclaim all of Alexander's empire, but both of them had been struck down by the tides of fate. Antigonus Gonatas therefore was quickly known as a cautious and wise king. He preferred a bird in his hand over two in a bush. While he got pushed out almost entirely by the Epirate campaign, he returned after Pyrrhus had departed for his new campaign on the Peloponnese. Not only did Antigonus reclaim and strengthen his rule over Macedonia, he also went on to create a lasting power block with the heirs of Seleucus, who had turned out to be the most successful of Alexander's heirs. Antiochus, son of the legendary Seleucus Nicator, was well known for his love for Stratonike, sister of Antigonus. In return, Antigonus was married to Phila, sister of Antiochus. This alliance between two of the most powerful Hellenistic states at the time would reaffirm their positions in the region, but of course also bring more enemies to the table. The primary enemy of both of these powers was led by Ptolemaeus II, pharaoh of Egypt and contender for power over all of the Hellenistic world. Ptolemaeus' father, also called Ptolemaeus, I mean it only makes sense, never attempted to reclaim the entirety of Alexander's empire, but instead focused on establishing a secure power base within Egypt. Ptolemaeus II followed in the footsteps of his father and Egypt's court experienced the heights of its material and literary splendor during his reign. Nonetheless, Ptolemaeus II also had ambitions and striking down the Seleucids along the Levantine coast was a major part of it. This, of course, meant that Ptolemaeus II sought to confront and possibly break the good relationships between the lords of Syria and Macedonia. Historically, his campaigns in the Aegean Sea and in the Levant led to momentary success but ultimately amounted to essentially nothing as he was fought back by the strong alliance that faced him. The Macedonian grip over the Aegean Sea could not be lifted by the Egyptian forces and while they, for a while, took control of much of the Levantine coast, the Seleucids fought them back there too at the later stage of Ptolemaeus' rule. The fortune and power of Egypt in the Aegean Sea truly requires a genius. It might be possible to become the ruler of the Hellenistic world if you are quick-witted and gain the support of much of the Peloponnese itself. Of course, while talking about Pyrrhus and the Diadochi, we have exclusively talked about the empires that want to gain control of the Hellenistic core world. However, the core world itself is extraordinarily interesting as well. For a long time now, the city-states of Hellas have suffered under the yoke of their imperial cousins. The lords of Athens and Sparta have fallen far beneath their former glory, leaving room for the question of whether they even have a future at all. Gone are the days during which they dominated Greek politics. First Alexander the Great, much like his father, dominated them and then the Diadochi demanded allegiance or threatened destruction. Historically, the Peloponnese would band together in the Achaean League to resist the influence of the empires around them. 
The struggle between these factions was intergenerational and changed the very face of Greek existence. Speaking of which, let's talk about the features of this mod, for there are plenty implemented and plenty planned. First of all, religion. Of course, the Hellenistic world is rather one-sided in terms of religions as, well, it's the Hellenistic world. That's the name. There are, however, still various flavors of Hellenism. For example, Pythodorianism follows the prophecies of the Oracle of Delphi, whereas Naism is focused on Zeus Naos, a version of Zeus worshipped at the oldest oracle of the Hellenistic world in the apparate city of Dodona. Sotorism, on the other hand, is much more intertwined with the dynastic rulers that established themselves after the empire of Alexander fell. Sotorism focuses on deifying rulers that have undertaken great deeds and are known as saviors. In fact, Antiochus of the Seleucid dynasty is known as Sota after repelling Gallic invaders in Anatolia by using Indian war elephants. While the faiths of this region are all quite similar, there is a large variety of cultures that I am sure will receive a number of cultural and regional innovations that will make your playthroughs more unique. Nonetheless, the biggest difference and unique aspect of apotheosis lies within its government forms. Just look at how many there are. I have been incredibly impressed with the vision the modders are attempting to realize in this mod. We are talking about the social contract, the social hierarchy and the organization of an ancient state playing the fundamental role that these topics truly deserve. The Diadochi, for example, are the dynastic, meaning that they follow the principle of aristocratic families leading the state. This is the closest thing in this mod that you will find to classic feudal rulers as you know them from CK3. Then we have the military command and the civil bureaucracy government forms. These bureaucrats were put into power by their overlords with the goal of establishing order and prosperity in the vast regions that make up an empire. Of course, as they are merely servants of their liege, they are also constantly open to experiencing a rapid decline in power should they fail to please their overlord. Revoking their titles would simply be a question of bureaucratic activity rather than tyranny. While a dynastic empire is organized from the top down, there are also various more open forms of empire management. Pyrrhus' kingdom, for example, is organized in a hegemonic alliance. While this grants him, the hegemon, a large amount of power, most of the members of such a realm feel that they are serving their overlord only because they are offered valuable protection. With the relationship between the lord and the vassal sour, such a realm could see former vassals leave with ease. Within Epirus, we can also find amphictonic coalitions that have banded together to protect a place sacred to their religion. They are together, as mostly, equals with a common goal. Also within Epirus, we can find federal sympolities that are quite similar to their amphictonic cousins, but are organized around a common cultural identity that must be protected against outsiders. Both of these coalition forms are highly decentralized, leaving little to the ruler at the top, but can, with some coercion and realpolitik, be transformed into properly hegemonic or federal organizations. For example, while Pyrrhus rules over a realm that is largely autonomous on the inside but unified by his claim to the Epirate throne, Hegemon Athanion of Astika rules over a land that is quite centralized as he is a hegemon while at the same time being a sympolity, meaning that the vassals that serve him are primarily serving him for they need to protect their common cultural identity and are surrounded by enemies. Of course, they are Dorian settlers, not native to this region. In the core area of this Hellenistic world, we can find the classic city-states that are largely organized in small and rapidly assembling as well as disassembling defensive leagues, democracy, as well as oligarchy. These structures are organized in a fashion that gives no leader too much power and oftentimes barely maintains anything even close to central authority. Especially interesting in this respect are the kings of Sparta as they are organized in the Retra system. In this system, there are two kings and a council. At the starting point of this mod, the council has taken most of the powers from the kings. Maybe you can take it back. What is even more interesting to me personally, however, is the fact that the mod does not shy away from introducing new interfaces and mechanics related to the sophisticated idea of leagues forming and dissolving as well as democracy. You can see a work in progress interface right here. It shows you that being elected as a ruler in a democratic city-state such as Athens does not give you unlimited power, quite the opposite. You will be tasked with maintaining a certain level of franchise, suppressing corruption and then facing new issues and emergencies as they appear. In a democracy, rulers can even gain more voting weight for the eventual election by simply being excellent public speakers and winning debates. I would be lying if I did not state just how impressed I am by the implementation of this government vision that the team clearly has. The team has made a grand decision here. Instead of focusing on religion, which of course is important but not nearly as decisive as it was in the medieval era, the team turned to enrich the human interactions that can be found within the organizational fabric of a society. With CK3 allowing much more freedom for GUI modding, I wonder just how far the modders can push it here. 
Now, with all that being said, let's simply address the elephant in the room here, the eye candy. The map is absolutely gorgeous and leaves a lot of room for expansion should that ever be a focus the modders want to take. After all, the young Roman Republic awaits in the west. It is not just the map that I want to highlight, however. Throughout this video, you must have noticed the utterly gorgeous title and family coat of arms art that is everywhere in this mod. Please keep in mind that most of the family coat of arms, for example, are randomly generated by art that the modders have included within their mod. And, I mean, look at this. It is utterly gorgeous. There are so many unique and truly beautiful sigils that can be found throughout the world and enrich your experience thoroughly. I have to say congratulations on whoever created these sigils. They are truly amazing. Now let's sum it all up and make it simple. This mod has recognized the strengths that a mod of this period must focus on by establishing the large cultural diversity of the Hellenistic world as well as the intricacy of their government systems. Make sure to join the Discord if you are interested in aiding the mod or at least keeping track of it. With all that being said, I would like to thank the members of the channel that are making videos such as this one possible, namely the Barons, the Counts and the Dukes. You all are absolutely gorgeous. For now, later. Alligator.